Okay, everyone, let's get started today. Welcome back to EC 20002. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements. So the first is I've decided to put uh, some of the older lectures onto YouTube. So there's now a YouTube playlist, just like Art Turlup did for his lectures. Uh, if anyone has any objections to that, please let me know. But it just all the lecture recording videos that I normally do, I put onto YouTube. Uh, mostly for file storage purposes, because there's a lot of big files on my computer now. Um, in a similar vein, I plan on pre-recording tomorrow's lecture uh, later tonight, maybe at 9.50 p.m. Uh, if anyone wants to check that out, I'll probably post on Piazza. If someone wants a slightly different time to record, like 8.50 p.m. or 7.50 p.m., do let me know. But uh, I do plan on pre-recording tomorrow's lecture just because I have uh, something I want to go to instead at the normal lecture time. I figured that would be OK. Um, the goal is to finish lecture set five between to this lecture and the pre-recorded lecture for tomorrow. So hopefully we finish lecture set five. And then we also need to be thinking about uh, questions you want to have answered for exam two, because exam two comes up a week from tomorrow. I'll do it live in case anyone wants to be part of the audience. So I figure it'll give a chance for people that are like, <laughs> on the Pacific Rim, a chance to participate. And I guess people that are up late in Eastern time. Yeah, the same times will be given for exam two, same window, everything. Yep, same Zoom link for the recorded lecture. I'll I'll send a reminder, I'll send a reminder out through Piazza and email. People like the idea of doing a late night lecture just for something different. Okay. Okay, well, it looks like I'll have at least a small audience. That's good. I like that. Um, I'm glad you responded well. And then for those who just, uh, yeah, switch to night mode. Time for Zoom dark mode. Um, let's see. I mentioned the YouTube videos. Uh, goal is to get all of homework three graded by tomorrow night. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Um, and remember, homework five will be due on Monday. Quiz four will happen, you know, Friday at the normal window of, you know, Friday noon to Saturday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, my goal is to have office hours tomorrow. Uh, I might be coming from a different location, though. All right. Do we have any questions about material? You know, uh, upcoming exam will mostly revolve around convolution. Laplace transforms and frequency response. Uh, lecture set six will not be on uh, exam two. I've made that decision. Well, we have graphical convolution. Uh, yeah, you might have a graphical convolution. I mean, like, or at the very least, there might be some convolution in you know some convolution problems where it is faster to solve graphically than uh, algebraically could throw in some ramps and some steps and say okay convolve these two things like the easiest way to convolve like trapezoid shapes is graphically generally. 
Thanks for reminding me. Remember, it was all Riyadh's idea to bring up graphical convolution. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it's something. Uh, the exam two has not yet been written. So uh, we'll see, but now, now we have time to include a graphical convolution. <laughs> no, no sabotaging your other classmates or or you know, forming a mob against them. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and start sharing the screen. We're one shy of the threshold voltage. I'm happy. So frequency response. So we started talking about you know, the topic label frequency response. So it's like different approaches to graphing the frequency response. So remember the frequency response has two components, a magnitude response and the phase response. And it's when you take HMS and you plug in J omega into everywhere you see an S. So it evaluates along the imaginary axis, which is another way of saying we're dealing with you know, purely sinusoidal inputs and outputs. I guess you could have like, you know, step functions in there too, but like a step just being a sinusoid stretched out very, very far. But for the most part, you know, sinusoids are the part that we care about. Uh, and, you know, we, we find that we're going to use a logarithmic frequency axis. So we looked at this example and uh, we, uh, you know, plotted it out, you know, or excuse me, first we looked at the transfer function relating VC of S to B N of S, and then we plugged in H of J omega, and we got, you know, the, you know, complete complex number four with the transfer function. We break that into its magnitude component and its phase component. Remember, you know, you convert a, uh, a rectangular form to a, uh, magnitude by taking the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And that has to include the omega in there. Uh, we also have the angle, you know, you know, the angle of divided complex numbers is the angle of the first minus the angle of the denominator. And that angle, uh, is going to be given for a complex number z is equal to a plus bi as arctan of b over a. So in this case, just arctan of rc omega. Negative sign because it's in the denominator. And then we have to choose a relevant frequency axis to plot over. So the sort of you know corner frequency of the circuit is going to be at 1 over rc, which in this case, 1 over rc is going to be 1 tenth of a radian per second. So that's an important one. So I just chose symmetric about there. And sure enough, you know, we get this where we have this linear uh, vertical axis, logarithmic frequency axis, vertical phase axis, logarithmic frequency axis. And by convention, we use degrees. And we made some notes about the limiting behavior going to zero and infinity for both the magnitude and the phase. And we said, OK, uh, this is going to be important for today's lecture. The greatest drop in magnitude occurs for a one decade centered at the interval. So right around here, it drops the most severely. And then for the two decades centered about 45 degrees, you know, that same point, we get basically almost straight line decrease of, you know, negative 45 degrees per decade. So. That's going to come up really shortly. So we'll have a graphical approach to the frequency response. So we're saying, hey, plugging in S equals J omega is the same thing as the point at 0, comma J omega. And when you subtract two vectors, you go from the tip of the uh, subtrahan towards the, sip of, towards the tip of the menu end. OK, the, the tip of the number being subtracted to the uh, number being subtracted from. 
So we can graphically interpret the, the frequency response as the length of all these vectors uh, corresponding to the zeros multiplied together divided by the length of all the vectors corresponding to the poles all multiplied together and then times the factor of k if we have one. And then the angle is going to be the sum of the angles you know, from the positive real axis uh, corresponding to the zero uh, vectors from the zeros minus the angle corresponding to uh, all the uh, poles, you know, yeah, vectors corresponding to the poles, I should say. It's a bit of a mouthful to explain graphically. That's why the math is written here for your convenience. So remember, we deal with products for, for magnitude sums for angles. And then we worked out this example where we got that, you know, evaluating at a single point, not omega as a variable, but omega as a single point, you know, we got, you know, a magnitude of 0.9487 and then a angle of 108.43 degrees. And that takes us up to today. So do we have any questions about frequency response? Very right, now let's talk about Bode plots. So uh, if you have, if you're trying to get the exact magnitude and phase response for circuits of many elements, it's going to be very inefficient to go through this process uh, algebraically. And if we had even more poles and zeros than this, like even graphically, you know, just even getting a single point of information would be troublesome, much less if we're trying to get, you know, uh, this algebraically as well. Uh, what we can do instead is, you know, uh, learn to live with an approximation. And this approximation is one that uh, is done graphically, but is used very often. So we're going to capture the major behavior of an LTI system using only pole and zero locations. So sacrifice a little accuracy for a much faster speed up through something called a Bode plot. Now, a Bode plot is named for Hendrik Wade Bode. He was a Dutch American who worked at Bell Labs in the 1930s when he came up with this. So we're dealing with relatively recent electrical engineering. And by recent, I mean uh, younger than 90 years old. And, uh, you know, he was also a major scientist during World War II. Uh, he helped, you know, defend London during the bombings, uh, you know, came up with a lot of, you know, useful scientific advances in service of the war. And then after the war, he worked with Claude Shannon to help, you know, create information theory and, you know, do a lot of things related to control systems. So if you ever, you know, take a controls class, you will hear more about Bodhi in there. So. Uh, an amazing electrical engineer. So the key is to use a log-log plot, so logarithmic frequency and logarithmic magnitude, where the magnitude response is in decibels. You know, that's, if you hit plotting in decibels, that's, you know, there's a log base 10 in there, so that's automatically a log-log plot. You just have to include a factor of 20 times. And then it's important to conceptualize complex frequency as the distance of a pole or zero from the origin, not the distance along the imaginary axis. So what we talked about how even though the pole is negative one over RC, which in pole zero plot land would be you know somewhere on the negative real axis, the effect of its you know the effect of that pole is felt even for a purely imaginary frequency. Uh, so, you know, we're going to start conceptualizing complex frequency uh, in, in heavy scare quotes as the distance of the polar zero from the origin, not as, you know, a purely real frequency along the imaginary axis, because that's, you know, how its effects are going to be felt. So the Bode plot we're going to construct is a piecewise linear approximation to uh, to the transfer function frequency response. 
Uh, do not confuse it for a Nyquist plot. A Nyquist plot isn't a log-log plot, you know, magnitude versus frequency and phase versus frequency. Instead, the Nyquist plot is going to have omega as a parameter, and it's a polar parametric plot where, you know, the actual magnitude is represented as the distance from the origin, and the angle is the angle from the positive real axis. So that's similar. It's also a very useful piece of information, but not a what we consider a Bode plot or a frequency response uh, of the normal type. So here are the rules for Bode plots. So for every pole in the left half plane with a distance from the origin of omega p, do the following. The magnitude plot is going to change asymptotic slope to negative 20 dB. So if it's continuing along, it'll decrease in slope by 20 dB per decade, beginning at that critical frequency omega p. The actual magnitude at the critical frequency is 3 dB down from the asymptotic expectation for real poles. So if we're going to have a straight line and then a straight line going like this. The actual place is going to be three decibels down from the intersection of the straight line segments. Uh, NB, which is Latin for nota bene or note well. If you have a complex pole that's resonant, it's going to create a peak that goes above the asymptotes. Now your phase plot is going to decrease uh, by 90 degrees over the two decades centered on the critical frequency. Uh, note well, a right hand pole is going to cause a 90 degree increase in phase angle instead. But those are the unstable ones. We don't like dealing with fan uh, right half plane poles. And, you know, the actual frequency or phase response is going to sort of, you know, curve around the asymptotes, uh, depending on what side of them they are on. And then most importantly, the effects of each pole and zero past are cumulative at a given omega p. So for every subsequent pole we passed, we decrease the slope by another 20 dB per decade. And we're going to you know, decrease the phase plot 90 degrees uh, uh, again. So you could you know, end up with you know, phase that wraps around or something like that. Hopefully not. Now, very similar by duality, we can talk about the rules for zeros in Bode plots on slide 28. So every zero on the left-hand plane with a distance from the origin of omega z, the magnitude plot will change asymptotic slope to 20 dB plus 20 dB per decade beginning at the critical frequency of omega z. So it's going to be, for example, it starts flat, and then at omega z, it's going to you know, slope upwards at 20 decibels per decade. For again, a decade is an interval corresponding to one order of magnitude or a factor of 10 you know, change in frequency. The actual magnitude at the critical frequency is three decibels up from the intersection of those two lines. So note well, a complex pole will produce what's called an anti-resonant peak that extends below the asymptote. So as it goes along, it'll dip below and then come back up and start following the asymptotic behavior. The phase plot is going to increase 90 degrees over the two decades centered at the critical frequency. So, you know, 45 degrees per decade slope. But a right half plane pole would cause a 90 degree decrease instead, but we don't like dealing with them. So hopefully those don't happen. The effects of each pole and zero past are cumulative at a given omega z. So uh, I don't have a simple example prepared, but I can show you kind of what it would look like with the plot on slice 23. So we need to convert this into a logarithmic magnitude plot. So what would happen is we'd get basically a straight line and then it would stay looking pretty straight up until 10 to the negative first, and then it would slope downwards at you know uh, 20 dB per decade. And remember, going to zero is the same as shooting down towards negative infinity decibels, because zero is at negative infinity decibels. So we'd have you know, a straight line segment and then shoots down, but the real blue line of the actual magnitude response would be 3 dB down from wherever those lines meet at 10 to the negative one. 
And the phase response already sort of looks like it. You can see that it would start at zero and then it would basically be a straight line segment between you know uh, 10 to negative two comma zero degrees and then to uh, 10 to the zero comma negative 90 degrees, just a straight line segment, and then it would flatten out again. Kind of the un unspoken part of the rule. Questions? Or are we ready for the more complicated example? These are rules you will have to sort of commit to memory. You know, you won't be given these sort of rules on the test. So, you know, uh, the final question of homework, what homework is due next? Homework five? Wow, already a homework five. Yeah, the final question of homework five will tell you these rules. Yes, it does have to be 20 decibels per decade. That's their change in magnitude for passing a pole or a zero. This the Bode plot approximation. That was the easy example. The more complicated example is going to apply these poles and zero rules on slides 27, 28 to uh, what we have on slide 29 and 30. So sketch a Bode plot for the following transfer function. H of s is equal to 10 times quantity s, or times s times quantity s plus 1, close quantity, all over s plus 1 one hundredth, close quantity, times s plus 10, quantity squared. So this is a system with two zeros and technically three poles, one of which is multiplicity 2. So there's a zero at s equals zero and s equals negative one and one at negative one one hundredth and at negative 10. Or technically two at negative 10. So the critical frequencies in order, you know, from decreasing to increasing, there's a zero at zero, a pole at one one hundredth of a radian per second, a zero at one radian per second, and a pole at 10 radians per second, technically two of them. So I'm going to read from slide 29 while showing what happens on slide 30. So consider what happens as omega goes down to zero, which would be off at negative and you know infinity side of the uh, frequency axis. So way off at negative infinity. What happens is h is j zero will go to zero. So that's the same thing as saying. The magnitude of h is j zero will be at negative infinity all the way at negative infinity point of the frequency axis. H of j omega in magnitude begins with a 20 dB per decade slope. And magnitude h of j omega or angle of h of j omega will start at positive 90 degrees. Because of our rule for zero, you know, basically all of the asymptotic behavior has already happened because it happens way off at a point we can't see called zero. And so we already have a 90 degree increase in phase compared to our sort of flat understanding of the world. So sure enough, we start at 90 degrees and this starts at negative uh, infinity. So now what happens? Apply the pole zero rules for each one in turn, counting multiplicity. So the next thing that happens is we have a pole at negative one one hundredth. So a pole will decrease our magnitude response slope by uh, 20 dB per decade. So it goes from being plus 20 degree per dB per decade to zero dB per decade. And it will stay like that until we reach the next polar zero, which would be at, you know, one radian per second or 10 to the zero. The actual fre frequency magnitude response will be three dB below that intersection point. So you can see the blue line is three decibels below. It's at negative 23 dB, roughly. You know, it's negative like 23.01 because, you know, the, the uh, 
common log of one half is negative 3.01 or something like that. But just call it three decibels. Everyone does. Good enough for government work. And the curves up. And that means we're going to start a uh, a a negative 45 uh, degree per decade slope one decade before that. So one decade before that, we'll start sloping down at 10 to the minus 2. And we'll start sloping down until we get, you know, towards 0. The next thing we need to do is apply the 0 at 1 radian per second. So at 1 radian per second, we're going to get a slope back up of 20 dB per decade. We'll go from flat to 20 dB per decade. And then the actual curve is going to be 3 decibels above that. So it's going to be at negative 17 decibels. And you know you can see it slopes back up until it's going to reach the next polar zero. Unfortunately, we kind of have to overlap with our previous curve and the phase response. Because what happens at 1 decibel will start being felt at you know, 1 tenth of not one decibel. What happens at one radian per second will start being felt at one tenth radian per second. So a zero is going to, you know, want to increase things up towards uh, uh, 90 degrees again. So we'll get a plus 45 dB or degree per decade slope for this segment. And then we would get another one up here, you know, that wants to slope up at 45 degrees per decade. The last thing we need to do is apply this pole of multiplicity two. And because the effects of each polar pass are cumulative, we need to basically double everything. So instead of sloping up at 20 dB per decade, it's going to you know, go down to 0 dB per decade and then to negative 20 dB per decade on our magnitude plot. And instead of being 3 decibels off, it's going to be 6 decibels off. So this is at minus 6 decibels is where the actual curve is. And it's going to continue down at that rate. What happens at 10 to the first starts being felt at you know 10 to the zeroth in the phase. So instead of sloping up at 45 dB degrees per decade, it'll be zero and then negative 45 degrees per decade. And then past that, we don't feel what happens at you know 10 to the zero radians per second anymore. We can just slope down at a full negative 90 degrees per decade between 10 to the first and 10 to the second. And then finally, we need to figure out what happens as omega goes to infinity, which is the last bullet point. So uh, omega goes to infinity because the degree of the denominator is greater than that of the numerator. We know for a fact we're going to head off towards zero again, which is the same thing as saying magnitude is going to head towards negative infinity decibels. So it's going to end with this negative 20 dB per decade slope, just like it started with a plus 20 dB per decade slope, after all pole zero interactions. And we get that the uh, phase response is going to end at negative 90 degrees, because it's the end of all of our stuff. It'll flatten back out again. So. I also took the advantage of plotting the exact, you know, uh, magnitude response. So you can see that the Bode uh, plot is a really good approximation to what's actually happening with the magnitude response. Like the blue and red overlap in some places because they're good asymptotes. Now, uh, it's really hard to calculate the phase response exactly. Like uh, I asked Wolf of Alpha to do it and like you can kind of see this was the best thing I could do when trying to reproduce what Rolf from Alpha did. It's really hard to do. But what you get is that there's a little bit of oscillation about this flat segment where it goes below the flat segment down to like 20 degrees and then up towards like, you know, six, you know, 50 or 60 degrees uh, about this flat segment between 10 to the negative first and 10 to the zero for radian per second. And of course, reminder, we had to count the multiplicity of the poles and zeros. So the multiplicity of that pole at 10 to the first radians per second had to be considered. 
that was a mouthful. There was a lot going on there, but it was just a sort of algorithmic application of all the rules. There has to be questions. What questions do we have? MATLAB has a nice Bode function. Yeah, that's definitely a good way to investigate how these Bode plots work. And as you can tell, everything here is piecewise linear. Oh yeah, the the Bode command B O D E in parentheses is the Bode plot, as you might expect. It's in like the control systems toolbox. Um, remember, you can always do H E L P space B O D E, and it'll give you the help function for. Uh, it'll give you some help on Bode. Ooh, as a MathWorks certified MATLAB associate, I feel like I'm compelled to agree that MATLAB is better than Python. Um, however, Python does have its place and it can replicate a lot of what MATLAB does. So I will say that with a caveat. Well, I don't have a Python certification, so I don't have to defend Python. Uh, we can access the entire browser of documentation for MATLAB within MATLAB. All right. I think we're sufficiently off topic. Let's, let's talk about magnitude and frequency scaling. So why learn transfer function scaling techniques? So some component values make more sense than others, especially when availability, price, and device ratings come into play. For example, if you want to buy a, uh, I don't know, a hundred nanofarad capacitor, easy. You know, they're available for like, you know, less than two cents. And there's, you know, thousands of options on DigiKey or Mauser or Octopart or whatever site you use to get parts. And like, you'll find that it has good device ratings, you know, it'll probably be rated, you know, you know, somewhere between six volts and 50 volts and can do whatever you want. However, if you're designing problems, designing based off of the, you know, the values we've given you, you know, you might need a supercapacitor in order to get up to one farad, like we do with some of our problems. And a one farad capacitor would just be insane. Like, you know, you might spend, you know, $3 per capacitor or something like that, you know, you know, a factor of a hundred times what you did before. And it's voltage rating, you know, might be good, but it's not going to behave quite as ideally. And the reason for this is, you know, you know, we we want we have we're trying to be educators here and you know work with nice values just to get the ideas across. But also, like as engineers, we don't want to spend extra effort dealing with you know uh, big numbers or very small numbers during our design phase uh, when we can just scale them later on. And scale them later on is exactly what we're going to do because we'll learn that the transfer function will behave the exact same way after scaling but all our power dissipations can be reduced, which is amazing. So we use magnitude scaling to allow for sensible component values to be used and frequency scaling to allow the key frequencies to be shifted predictably. Because, you know, most of the time we're not going to deal with a one radian per second type filter because one radian per second is going to be, well, whatever one over two pi hertz is. Uh, 
you know, it's going to be like four, you know, point uh, one four hertz or something like that, which is you know not usable. You know, even power line stuff is sixty hertz, and voice band goes from uh, you know roughly four hundred hertz to you know four thousand or eight thousand hertz. I typically use eight thousand hertz because I like the better audio quality. And you know, human hearing goes up to 20,000 Hertz. And then of course we have all sorts of radio technology stuff and the megahertz and microwave technology stuff and the gigahertz. So, you know, we want to be able to work with different uh, frequencies depending on our application. I guess, yeah, I should throw off the, you know, we have, you know, power line voice, you know, uh, audio, RF and microwave. So let's talk about magnitude scaling. We've actually kind of done this already in EC 20001. You just weren't, you know, thinking about it. So when we have dealing with ratios, ratio metric type design, we're actually dealing with this. So say, for example, we have this, you know, very simple voltage divider where we're trying to get VR2 from VN. Well, we don't need to bust out Laplace transforms, but we'll do anyway. So we'll get VR2 over VN of function of S is R2 over R1 plus R2. So let's say that R2 is just some function or some constant K times R1, K being greater than zero because we have to deal with, real, you know, positive resistances. So H of S is just going to be equal to K over K plus one, which is just a set fraction. So if we set R1 equal to one ohm and K equals two, then we're going to get that we, for a nine volt battery, you know, we attach our nine volt battery, we'll get H of S is equal to two thirds, but the power dissipation would be 27 U of T watts. So we're, we're burning 27 watts, which is a heck of a lot of power. That resistor is going to need fins and uh, probably some heat sinking in order to work. Excuse me. Now let's try R1 equal to 1000 ohm and K equals two, same nine volt battery, same transfer function of two thirds, but the power dissipation is only going to be 27 milliwatts as a step function. So by scaling up by a factor of 1,000, our power was scaled down by a factor of 1,000. So this reduction in power dissipation, same you know, transfer function, you know, it's going to make your battery last longer because it has a finite uh, capacity. It's going to reduce your heat dissipation. It means you don't need bigger heat sinks and you don't need less thermal paste, all sorts of things like that. Because remember, you know, as electrical engineers, we have to be concerned about the, the thermal properties of our circuits that we design, but we really don't want to be. We want to leave that for mechanical engineers. So here are all the rules for magnitude scaling. So let's say we want to scale up an impedance magnitude by Km. So we want to increase all impedances by a factor of Km. So we need to multiply by Km for the following things. Resistances, so R is going to be Km times R after you scale. Inductances, L will become Km times L. A generic impedance will become, you know, Z becomes Km times Z. And a current controlled voltage source, uh, you know, denoted with a trans resistance, we'll have R, little r sub m become km times r sub m. Now we have to divide by km for the following things. Conductances become g over km. Capacitances become c over km. Generic emittances become y over km. And then a voltage control current source transconductance, little gm becomes gm over km. Makes sense. And we leave alone the following things. Voltage gains. Like, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, voltage to voltage, A, A sub V stay it's the same. Current gains, A sub I stay the same. And ideal op amps and things like that, you know, they will stay the same. 
So our transfer function may get altered or maybe not, depending on what type of transfer function it is. So we work with the basic ones. So if we magnitude scale uh, and we have a dimensionless transfer, you know, transfer uh, function, so one that like relates a voltage to a voltage or a current to a current, then we'll get H prime of S. Our new transfer function is just H of S, the same. Uh, if H of S is units of impedance in ohms, then our new transfer function is Km times our old transfer function. And if H of S is units of emittance in Siemens, then our new transfer function is one over Km times our old transfer function. And importantly, our pole zero plot is altered. So whatever you do for your pole zero plot before with all their locations, they will exactly stay the same. So, excuse me, let's look at an example. So now instead of a resistor divider, we'll have an impedance divider. So now we'll have uh, find the capacitor voltage in the series RC circuit. Well, we're very used to this, you know, transfer function. You're relating capacitor voltage to input voltage. It's one over RCS plus one. So if we choose two ohms and four farads for our capacitor with a, you know, six volt battery, we'll get H of S is going to be one over eight seconds times S plus one, because that's our time constant, eight seconds, R times C. The power dissipation is going to be uh, 18 watts at time equals zero. Then it's going to decay according to e to the negative uh, 2t over eight seconds. Right. And if you're wondering where the two comes from, it's because we have to square the voltage. So when you square the voltage, you know, squaring an exponential is the same thing as multiplying the the x1 apart by a factor of two. So yeah, the voltage does decay twice as fast, but like, not well. So now if we apply, you know, magnitude scaling, because the two ohm resistor is a little too small to be comfortable with, power dissipation was too high, and then a four frac capacitor is just not possible to get. So, 10 to the fourth, we'll have 20 kilo ohm resistance, pretty easily to get, and a 400 microfarad capacitor, which is a little big, but like it's not impossible. Like it would have to be like an aluminum electrolytic, like can type capacitor, but that's fine. So we still have H of S is one over eight seconds times S plus one, but the power dissipation is down to 1.8 milliwatts at time equals zero, and then it decays uh, with the time constant of four seconds. So the reduction of power dissipation with the same bat battery means our limited capacity battery lasts longer, reduces heat dissipation, shrinks all the heat sinks, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's look at uh, a slightly different transfer function. Let's say we just want the current through the capacitor instead of the voltage to the capacitor. So now when we get one over R plus one over SC, we'll get CS times RCS plus one. So uh, with the same values, six, six volt battery, you know, we get four farads times S over uh, eight seconds times S plus one. The power dissipation is going to be 18, you know, watts and then decay like that. And then same scaling causes the same, you know, 20 K ohm resistance, 400 microfarad capacitor. And then we have 1.8 milliwatts instead at time equals zero. And then it decays. H of S is now different though. The transfer function did change by a factor of one over KM, but notice this pole location, you know, don't know, you know, you know, you know, implied by this time constant in front of S in the denominator stayed the same. But because we, you know, have a different transfer function with units of admittance, you know, the it was rescaled down by a factor of a thousand times. Cool. 
questions? Hearing no questions, let's talk about the other type of scaling, which is frequency scaling. So the rules for scaling an impedance magnitude by KF in omega prime is equal to KF times omega. So now we want to shift all frequencies of interest so that they are KF times bigger than whatever we designed them to be. So our new frequencies of interest will be KF times whatever it was before. So the rule, if you can think about, you know, well, the impedance of a capacitor is just, uh, or impedance of an inductor is just omega L or J omega L. Impedance of a capacitor is one over J omega C. If you really want to change where the frequency occurs, all you need to do is divide KF by KF for inductances. So L becomes L over KF and capacitances C becomes C over KF. And you just leave alone all the voltage gains, current gains, resistances, conductances, linear dependent sources, and ideal op amps. They all stay the same. So the rules for a new transfer function after applying magnitude scale into an original transfer function. So in all cases, the transfer function is the same thing as the transfer function, just with S divided by K sub F. And the pole zero plot will get changed. It will get expanded by KF radially outward along lines through the origin. So your natural frequency gets expanded outwards. Your, uh, you know, so that circle gets expanded by a factor of KF. Omega D, the damped resonance frequency, gets expanded out by a factor of KF. All cutoff frequencies by KF. Bandwidth, which we uh, haven't talked about yet, but it's coming up soon, that'll get expanded by a factor of KF. Because it's just the difference of two frequencies. So both of them get expanded. So looking at an example, We have right here a new, uh, uh, well, same circuit as before, just with a, a new thing we're doing to it. So we'll keep the two ohms the same and the four farads the same in our voltage to voltage transfer function, uh, six, six volt battery. And we still have uh, H of S is gonna be one over eight seconds times S plus one. So now we'll just frequency scale by a factor of 100. So uh, instead of being at, you know, uh, one eighth of a hertz, this is going to be at 100 eighths of a hertz cutoff frequency now. So we're going to have same two ohm resistor, which we can't really uh, do much about. I just noted a tiny error where I'm using R sub one and it's not really necessary, but that's fine. We'll still have H of S uh, uh, gets changed to one over 80 milliseconds S plus one. So as you can see, we divided every time we saw an S, we divided by a factor of 100 in front of it. So we got one, so we got 80 milliseconds instead now. The power dissipation, exactly the same. Frequency scaling will not affect the power dissipation. So we're still going to dissipate, you know, way too much power. But the cutoff frequency, also known as the half power frequency associated with the pole, moved up by the factor of KF. So if we look at the other transfer function, the one with uh, the admittance, so it looks like this, and then it'll change, you know, in both places in front of the S divided by 100, so it becomes 40 millifarads and uh, 80 milliseconds in the denominator. So the pole and the zero get scaled, but the zero we notice was right here at the origin. So like it doesn't really move. It just, you know, the effect was just, just scaled the, 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 
uh, the, it did scale to zero, but like when you scale something that's at the origin, it just stays the same. So uh, if we're feeling adventurous, we can apply both magnitude and frequency scaling at the same time. And this is implicitly how we design things like exams and things like that. So if you ever are uh, involved in teaching this course or similar courses in electrical engineering or circuits, you can always do magnitude and frequency scaling to, you know, get, you know, nice values or work with nice values and then use realistic values in homework or something like that. So we use frequency scaling. We typically think about the frequency scaling first because we need to move all of our, you know, natural frequencies or resident frequencies or our cutoff frequencies to a, an appropriate uh, place first for our re desired range of operation. And then we'll do magnitude scaling to get sensible part values. So if we do general scaling of the common components, resistances become Km times R, reductances become one over Km times G, reductances become Km over Kf times L, capacitances become one over Km Kf times C. And this kind of makes sense. You know, we deal with resistances that are, you know, in the kilo ohm, you know, up to like, you know, the the hundreds of mega ohm type range and then we like to deal with inductances that are in the like micro henry up to like single henry range and we like to deal with capacitances that are like in the you know picofarad up to millifarad type of range when we can so that kind of makes sense why those are the most common part values when you go and buy things from digikey mauser or any of the other part suppliers and this general scaling is going to be crucial when we work with resonance sisters, which is the exact next topic, and filters, which we're going to talk about in lecture set seven. Because this allows us to, you know, actually design circuits, not just analyze them. So we're kind of moving towards the design of circuits instead of just the analysis of them. So what questions do we have? No questions. All right, is everyone okay with lecture at 9.50 p.m. tonight? Or is there someone who's like, I could make it if it were earlier instead. I don't wanna go later than 9.50 p.m. if I can help it. For those who wanna do, you wanna do, I can do 8.50 p.m. How does that work? 850 is good. All right, let's just, I'll put it on my calendar then. We'll do uh, tomorrow's lecture recorded with a, in front of a live studio audience. Well, not really, I'm, I'm alone here uh, at 8.50 p.m. tonight. Goodbye, everyone. See you in office hours.